The Dixon Minimum Security Prison in North Central Illinois. It has expanded hospital facilities, a death on average every month. It's the last stop for many lifers. Right now, it looks like the final home for this man, William George Hirons, someone known to a generation of Chicagoans as the Lipstick Killer. Long before the world became aware of the serial killer, uh, he was the guy, and he was good at it. Jailed since he was 17, Hirons interviewed with American Justice at age 72 in the 55th year of his imprisonment. As the longest serving inmate in the history of the Illinois correctional system, Hirons knows all the rules of prison life as second nature. Rules like do your own time and trust no one. Once you come to prison, you don't have many friends, especially outside friends. They, they kind of fall away. And, uh, but you have inside friends, prisoners that are your friends. But they can't do much for you. More than anything, Hirons needs friends. The soft-spoken inmate has been fighting for so long, he can barely put his protests into words anymore. And his story is one people in Chicago don't want to revisit. Even today, the city's leaders have declined comment, and Hirons thinks he knows why. It's about the three murders for which he has spent his entire adult life behind bars. Murders he insists he did not commit. The pressure was on from the newspapers to solve the crime. It had to be solved. And I don't think they cared how it was solved. So if it wasn't me, there would be somebody else. The story begins in Chicago at the end of World War II. It was a more innocent age in the city of big shoulders. In those days, you could, unaccompanied by an adult, uh, go down to the park and to the beach and walk home with friends late at night and no one would think twice of it. The G.I.s were coming home to a good Cubs baseball team at Wrigley Field and five newspapers in a fierce circulation battle. World War II probably helped fuel the appetite of newspaper readers. People wanted more information, they wanted more news and that did not uh, dissipate when 1945 came on and V.J. occurred. Now that the monster of the Third Reich was defeated, Chicago's dailies, led by the powerful Chicago Tribune from its gothic tower on Michigan Avenue, searched for the next big story. The papers would soon find it in another monster, a killer believed to be stalking the city's windy streets. In June 1945, in the Edgewood neighborhood on the city's north side, a young woman discovered the body of her mother, 43-year-old Josephine Ross, in the apartment they shared. Ross had been attacked in her bedroom, beaten and stabbed. Then the killer meticulously washed her. The last detail was a possible earmark of a serial killer, though at the time that term didn't exist. He put her back into bed. Uh, he took adhesive tape and he closed the wounds uh, he then covered her partially with a sheet. Six months later, December 10th, 1945, 33-year-old Northsider Frances Brown was found dead in her apartment, another victim, it seemed, of the killer. The records indicate that he shot her twice. He then stabbed her. He bathed that victim as well. Uh, and uh, she was found half in and half out of the bathtub. Police had no leads on a suspect, but because of the brutality of the two attacks and the washing of the bodies, they were sure the same person had killed both women. One other element of the Francis Brown killing ensured its notoriety. The culprit, it seemed, left behind a calling card. There was lipstick writing on the wall. This is a famous if not original, lipstick writing case. It was a horrifying plea. For heaven's sake, catch me before I kill more. I cannot control myself. 
Brown was found murdered in her apartment. Scary uh, and rocked Chicago. Of course, the city was no stranger to bloodshed. Back in the bootleg era, when Al Capone ran the town, murders were commonplace, even on Valentine's Day. But in those days, the gangsters mostly killed each other. The random savagery of the lipstick killer didn't jibe with a city known for its strong, safe neighborhoods. You knew the grocer, you'd go down there and he'd give you an apple or something. Um, you'd walk to school with your friends. People would dress up to go to a movie in the loop. People wore hats, they wore ties, they wore the old fedora. Women were all dressed in the finest that they had. Things like this just didn't happen. But it turned out the December murder of Francis Brown was a prelude to even more horror and the case that would fundamentally change Chicago. It would happen just one month later. It was always said that it was back in January of 1946 that Chicago first locked its doors. It was a safe American city. And then Bill Herons came here and ended all that. He was a 17-year-old burglar who'd grown up in Chicago and would soon take center stage in the biggest story of 1946, a story that is still provoking controversy today, more than half a century later. Illinois inmate William Hirons is a living time capsule. He hasn't seen freedom in over 50 years. The world he left behind no longer exists outside his cell doors. And there's so darn much you do miss. When you're away from it for as long as I've been, uh, you can't say you're hurting because you're not doing it anymore. It just becomes a sort of a dream of the past, that's all. For anyone involved in the story of William Hirons, the dream that is 1946 is a perpetual nightmare. No more so than for Betty Degnan Finn. You should live with hope, I guess, but uh, I would like to go back to 1946 and not have that happen. That would have been nice hope for us. Betty was 10 years old when her family moved to Chicago in the summer of 1945. At the time, the city was home to the largest stockyards in the nation. And her father, Jim Degnan, was an administrator with the Wartime Meat Regulation Board. The Degnans rented an apartment in the Northside Edgewater Beach neighborhood near Lake Michigan. Betty's little sister, Suzanne, was six. She was very bubbly, just always doing something. She never sat still. January 7th, 1946. It was back to school after the Christmas holiday for the Degden girls. My mother would wake us up and she went into my room, woke me up, and then went to Suzanne's room. I could hear my mother scream. The six-year-old was missing. Police were called to the family's first floor apartment. They surmised someone had entered and left through Suzanne's window, which had been found standing wide open. Later that morning in the bedroom, police found a crumpled up ransom note left by the culprit. It read, get $20,000 ready and wait for word. Do not notify FBI or police. Bills in fives and tens. There was no sign of the missing girl and no other indication that it was a kidnapping. That evening, the search for answers ended with a horrible discovery. January 7th, 1946, truly uh, a date that lives in infamy in Chicago history. Following an anonymous tip, police started checking neighborhood sewers. At the bottom of one, obscured by the gloom, was the severed head of the missing six-year-old girl. From other sewers and catch basins around the neighborhood, police recovered her dismembered torso, her legs, and later, her arms. When they found out that Suzanne was dead, because we thought she was still alive, the parish priest was, was there with my parents. And so he told me. 
because it was too hard for my parents. More than the murders of the other two Chicago women, the horror of Suzanne Degnan's abduction and dismemberment caught the public's attention. Chicago's papers had found their next big story. The Degnan case hit in January of 1946. The war was over. It was a time, uh, winter time. People were inside. They wanted to read newspapers more than even in the summer. And this happened, as far as the circulation was concerned, probably, quote, at a perfect time. The media was terrible. They just camped out in front and just stayed there. They kept calling, couldn't leave the house without them following you every place you went. This six-year-old girl taken from her home, from her bedroom, and murdered in a brutal way caused the public to be up in arms, and the newspapers fueled this. So obviously, there was a lot of pressure put on the law enforcement authorities, not by the public by so much as by the newspapers. Police rounded up suspects, then quickly dropped them. It wasn't until the summer that they finally caught a break. June 26, 1946. A 17-year-old prowler is captured near the Degnan neighborhood. His name, William Hirons. The suspect is an odd paradox. He is a student at the University of Chicago, but also a compulsive thief who has made the North Side's apartments the target of numerous burglaries. He wasn't a Dems and Dozers. He wasn't a street guy. He may have been a what they call a problem child, but he wasn't your typical background of a criminal that would be up for a murder or burglary charge. But according to police reports, at the time of his arrest, Hirons demonstrates a propensity for violence. My information was, and this was told to me by the police, that he pulled a gun on a detective. The gun jammed. Had that bullet been fired, if that gun would have been working properly, he could have killed a police officer. Because his burglaries occurred near Suzanne Degnan's neighborhood, he is immediately questioned about her murder. Then, three days later, the authorities make a major announcement. William Hiron's fingerprints match a partial print found on the Degnan ransom note. State's attorney William Toohey's conclusion is emphatic. From that moment on, with the papers reporting every step, the case moves fast and furiously. After one week, it's reported that Hiron's handwriting matches the ransom note. While in custody, authorities interrogate him using sodium pentothal. Papers tout it as a truth drug to loosen his tongue. The full transcripts are never released, but the papers are told the results were miraculous. After two weeks, Hiron's fingerprints are linked to the Francis Brown crime scene, the notorious lipstick murder. All the while, the papers are plumbing his psyche, turning the story into pulp fiction, a portrait of the maniac as a young man. Hirons is a split personality, Jekyll and Hyde, and a compulsive sexual deviant. The authorities felt at the time that there was some connection between um, the murders that he committed, the motives behind it, and getting some kind of sexual gratification, that he was getting his kicks out of it, in other words. That was some of the stories that were going around. How true that is, I don't know. Finally, after more than a month in custody, Hirons gives the authorities what they have been demanding. A full confession to the murders of Josephine Ross, Francis Brown, and six-year-old Suzanne Degnan. The papers are given instant access to the confession and print highlights, but they ignore a crucial point. The transcripts reveal that Hiron's answers are vague, responding mostly no, yes, or I don't know. One of his longest answers concerns the dismemberment of Suzanne Degnan, but it contains no details. He says, quote, I didn't know the exact facts what happened until later I read about it, and it was made known to me that way. After the confession, the streets of Edgewater become a media circus. The press and hundreds of spectators follow the police, who lead William Hirons on a reenactment of the crimes. The 17-year-old never has a trial. His confession is the foundation of a plea bargain that saves him from the electric chair but guarantees him three consecutive life terms. The inmate told American Justice he had no other choice. Back in 46, I buckled under. When the pressure's on, you go the way they want you to go. 
Today, half a century later, Hiram sits in prison and is remembered much like Nathan Leopold and Richard Loeb, the notorious thrill killers also from the University of Chicago. But for decades, Hiram has been saying that the official history is a travesty. Up next, his story of the interrogation and the woman who 40 years later heard it and decided to take on the lipstick killer as a friend and a crusade. That's next. Now back to Who is the Lipstick Killer? You're on A&E. In 1946, a 17-year-old Chicagoan named William Hirons was set off to prison after confessing to the murder of two women and a little girl. He was left there, many hoped, to die. His sentence will not be completed until he is old and he is cold and he is dead. That is the bargain that he wanted back in 1946. But soon William Hirons was saying that bargain was built on a lie. He insisted he had confessed solely to save himself from the electric chair, not because he was guilty. Hirons told American Justice a story he has been telling for years, that his life was destroyed on a single day in June 1946. He claims he was just a thief who like to look for unlocked apartments. I would just go to an open door and if nobody was inside, I'd look around and see what there was. If there's a purse, I'd generally go for the money in it. Iron says he had an upcoming date with a girl and he needed cash. Since he'd grown up on the city's north side, he took the elevated train to this stop. I got off the L and went to one of the apartment buildings nearby that I'm familiar with for uh, daylight burglary. And I was spotted and I was chased. Irons was finally captured after a fierce battle with a police officer. He shot three times at me and missed. And so I jumped him and while we were struggling, somebody else came up behind me and picked up some flower pots on people had on their back porch and used them as a hammer to hit me over the head. Irons admits that before he was fired upon, he pulled out a gun. But he claims he didn't try to fire it and had no intention of shooting anyone. After this, Hirons says, and there is little dispute, police came at him full force, questioning him about the murder of Suzanne Degnan and the two other unsolved murders. He went almost a week with very little food or water before he was allowed to see his lawyers. He spent most of that time under a naked bulb in a jail hospital because he'd sustained head injuries during his capture. I was strapped down to a bed and they uh, questioned me, but I decided then not to answer the questions. I didn't have to, so I wasn't very cooperative that way. But the pressure was relentless. Hiram says he wasn't allowed to sleep. He was beaten shot up with sodium pentothal, and even administered a painful spinal tap. I don't know why the heck they gave it to me. It's sort of like sucking your brain out through that little hole. You get a terrible headache. I had a headache for all about six weeks after that, from that. The pressure, he said, didn't stop until he had confessed. But when Hirons tried to raise these issues on appeal, the courts were not interested. In 1954, the Illinois Supreme Court decided that while there may have been, quote, flagrant violations of his constitutional rights, none were material to the outcome of the case. Irons, the court ruled, did not deserve a new trial. Those things that happened in 1946, those courts have said they did not result in any pieces of the evidence that were used against him during the course of his plea to each of these three murders. And so, while the inmates didn't stop protesting his innocence, there weren't many who wanted to listen. That is, until 1986, when Hirons met Dolores Kennedy, someone not only willing to listen, but also willing to stand by him for the long haul. Kennedy was then a legal secretary in Chicago. 
One day, she was out for lunch with her father, an attorney. He told her that he had been introduced to the infamous lipstick killer, and based on the man's prison record, had plans to represent him in efforts to win parole. He said, you know, I'd really like you to go with me to meet this man because I was very favorably impressed with him. This was unusual because he had really never asked me to accompany him on any of his legal visits before. But Kennedy's father died from cancer before they made the visit to see William Hirons. As time went by, her father's invitation lingered like an unmet promise. So Kennedy decided to try to honor it. She began looking back through the coverage of the case, one she had vague memories of from when she was nine. I thought to myself, oh my God, why do I want to do this? This man's a monster. And you know, I got past that because of my dad. She made the visit. Much to her surprise, what she found was a world away from the newspaper coverage. He was just a very kind man, a, a very gentle man. We talked about his experience with my dad. We talked a lot about his case. At first, Kennedy found herself less interested in what William Hirons had allegedly done than in what he had become. By the time she met him, he was one of the most accomplished inmates in the Illinois system. Irons had been the first prisoner ever in the state to earn a college degree while behind bars. He had learned how to tailor clothes, how to fix televisions, even how to paint, and had produced numerous watercolor canvases. He was also a self-taught jailhouse lawyer and had used his legal knowledge to try to help himself as well as other inmates. Over the years, he has certainly developed a life within the institution, which it appears to me you have to do. He has helped hundreds of people who have needed legal help, who've needed advice. Kennedy also spoke with Monsignor Tom Miller, who ministered to the population at Vienna Prison. Irons worked as his clerk for 16 years. By the time I got to know Bill Irons, he was just a nice middle-aged man who was very supportive to the chapel and to the work I was doing, very grateful for the work I'd done. I called a man who had been a warden at Diana Correctional Center, and he said, Dolores, Bill will never tell you this, but he was instrumental in developing the educational system and the library system in the Illinois prisons, and he said he's just an exceptional man. Kennedy couldn't figure it out. How could a monster at 17 who received zero psychiatric treatment grow into an accomplished and mature adult, held in minimum security, a friend to priests and wardens with no history of violence or serious mental illness during his long incarceration? He was a puzzle. He was definitely a puzzle. And he shared with me, I think, as much as and more than he's ever shared with anyone because I was persistent. It took time, something Hirons had plenty of. Eventually, the inmate opened up about what had put him behind bars in the first place, the events of 1946, and his life before it. He didn't hit me with, gee, Dolores, you know, I'm innocent. But I began to see that there were a lot of things that had gone on in 1946 that certainly had not shown up in the newspaper articles that I read. I finally said to him, you know, Bill, it seems to me that you need to write a book or something needs to be written about what actually happened in 1946. Kennedy, who had been a journalism major in college, soon turned that suggestion into her own full-time job. And it was that major project which ultimately put me in touch with all the reasons why I believe that Bill Hirons is innocent. Kennedy's book, called His Day in Court and published in 1991, argued that William Hirons was a scapegoat, a man who had spent his entire adult life behind bars for murders he did not commit. Making that point in a book is one thing, proving it to a parole board is quite another, especially in a case where the inmate confessed to the crimes in some detail. Back in a moment here on A&E.
In 1991, Chicago and Dolores Kennedy published a book about the city's notorious lipstick killer of 1946, William Hirons. She had come to a shocking conclusion, something Hirons had been saying for years, that he had served almost half a century behind bars on trumped-up charges for three murders. I believe so strongly in Bill, in his innocence, and in the fact that he should be released. When you get, get somebody interested in the case and willing to stick with it, uh, you've got some. And I'm darn lucky to have Dolores. In her research, Kennedy came to believe that very little of what was reported in 1946 matched reality. Even the man's family name, which had become well known in the city as William Herons, had been mispronounced. Somehow or other, back in 1946, when he was so heavily publicized, somebody decided that the pronunciation was Herons, and it just caught on. When I came onto the scene, I was calling him Bill Herons, too. And his mother actually said, you know, our name really isn't Herons, it's Hirons. Kennedy had concluded that lipstick killer William Herons was a role the burglar William Hirons had been forced to play and that he had been set up for it by a troubled childhood. Hirons had grown up on Chicago's north side. His family got by, but finances were tight because his father George was an alcoholic. His parents often fought. William, the older of two, was a bright child. Quiet, but not without problems. I guess we could describe him today as kind of a punk kid who liked to carry weapons and act like a tough guy and somehow or other this was important to him in, in, in light of his family situation. Iron started robbing apartments when he was in the seventh grade. In time he grew into a strange contradiction. He was polite, well liked, and had the academic wherewithal to be admitted to the prestigious University of Chicago. Even while he maintained a second life as a burglar. Dolores Kennedy says that while Hiron's criminal tendencies may have made him the perfect suspect for Chicago's unsolved murders, one thing is clear about his background. There was never any indication that he would ever hurt anyone, and if you talk to people who've known Bill down all the years, they all know that about him, that he, there is no violence in his nature. Frank Sagani is one who has known Bill Hirons down through the years. They became good friends in 1944, when Frank was 18, when they both had summer jobs at a steel mill on Chicago's south side. Frank says he cannot imagine how his friend could have murdered anyone. Bill's idea of life was to look ahead, and education was very, very important to him. He talked about that. That was his primary discussion with me, was being somebody someday. In 1946, Authorities explained the contradiction in Hiron's personality by revealing that the teenager had admitted to having a split personality. But the only evidence that has ever been found of this serious mental defect came out in Hiron's brutal interrogations. At one point, as the papers reported, he blamed the murders on a thrill killer alter ego he called George Merman. His detractors say this helps to show that the teenager was an unapologetic sexual sadist. Bill Herons is a self-confessed, depraved murderer whose body count, uh, despite all his recent protestations, remains at least three. But Herons now says he was forced to invent the stories of George Merman because that was what the cops wanted to hear. His supporters insist that if you look closely at the known facts, it's easy to see how Hirons could have been railroaded into taking responsibility for these three gruesome murders. The fingerprint evidence is uh, very interesting. Chicago defense attorney Jed Stone was recruited by Kennedy to examine what remained of the evidence against Bill Hirons. No one in 1946 challenged the claim that Bill's fingerprint was found on the ransom note. No one challenged the claim that Bill's fingerprint was found on the door jam of the Brown apartment. According to Jed Stone, even those fingerprints 
the best physical evidence authorities had against William Hirons, would never have stood up in court. This is Hirons' print, which the Chicago authorities said they found on the ransom note, the subject of the first public revelation that he was the leading suspect. But where did it come from? Initially, the Chicago police announced they had found no prints on the note. J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI lab, using more sophisticated techniques, found two prints on the front of the note. When the Chicago authorities, years later, talked about where they had found Hiron's print, it had materialized, seemingly from thin air, on the back of the note. What's known about the other print, this one supposedly found at the Francis Brown crime scene, is just as troubling. In the mid-1990s, Kennedy and Stone had it tested and found it had some strange characteristics. We hired a retired FBI fingerprint examiner, and he called and said, in my entire career, I've never seen at a crime scene the entire left and right-hand margins of a fingerprint left on a crime scene, on a door jam. It doesn't happen. The only reasonable way it could have happened, Stone argues, is if it were deliberately faked at a police station. When you roll a fingerprint, you roll the entire left and right-hand margins onto an inked card. Then, using scotch or cellophane tape, you can remove it from the card, place it on the door jam, remove the cellophane tape, and voila, you have a fingerprint on a door jam. The other physical evidence used against William Hirons was even less reliable. In 1946, handwriting samples taken by police supposedly matched the ransom note and the lipstick writing. But experts hired by Hirons, as well as numerous independent evaluators, have concluded Hirons wrote neither message. Handwriting wiped out. Fingerprints cracked and crumbling. Today, a full review of the physical evidence is impossible. Most of Hirons' files at Chicago Police Headquarters and at the state's attorney's office have gone missing or been destroyed. But even if the original evidence was available, it still would not explain his confession, the thing that more than anything else has kept Hirons behind bars. He'd said he did it. The question that every reasonable person asks every time a confession is challenged in court. How could you ever confess to a crime you didn't commit? The attorney answers by saying in 1946, the Miranda warning didn't yet exist. And Hirons faced a police force renowned for its lack of restraint. This is a 17-year-old boy in a jail, paraded every day past an electric chair, being taunted and told he's going to sit in that chair soon. And he is scared. He says, I didn't do it. They torture him to confess. And he says, I didn't do it. But in the end, according to William Hirons, something else pushed him over the edge. A single story in Chicago's most powerful newspaper. Up next, the exclusive article Hirons has sealed his fate. It told the story of his confession. It ran on the front page of the Chicago Tribune, and it was a lie. The conclusion of American Justice next, here on A&E. Conclusion of Who is the Lipstick Killer, here on A&E. Could Chicago's notorious lipstick killer of 1946 have been a scapegoat? That man, William Hirons, insists there were many reasons he confessed to three murders he did not commit. He was tortured by police, isolated, and denied a lawyer for days. But even this, he says, he could have withstood had it not been combined with the power of Chicago's five newspapers. Their overwhelming influence on public opinion was something else entirely. And what they were putting in the newspaper was that I was guilty because the state attorney says he was guilty. So uh, I was getting it pretty bad in the newspapers. This became sensationalized in the Chicago press. This city was shook. 
It was looking for someone to take responsibility for these crimes, and it found the 17-year-old petty burglar, Bill Hirons. The pressure was enormous. That was, quote, a crime of the century at the time, as Beck was later on and John Wayne Gacy later on was. The publicity was tremendous. The newspapers were fueling it by stories each day, new angles on the case. In 1946, the relationship between reporters and police was far less adversarial. Reporters were given access to almost every development and printed every leak. In this story especially, what was fact and what was fiction blended together. There are those today who will say that that scrawling on the uh, woman's apartment said, uh, for heaven's sakes, I can't control myself, it was not written by William Herons or any suspect, but by a newspaper reporter. Irons insists he could do nothing but watch as the papers turned him into a monster. The last straw was when the Tribune published a confession story. That Chicago Tribune story was written by popular reporter George Wright, published on July 16, 1946, two and a half weeks after his capture. It purported to give the full story of Hiram's confession, how he killed Suzanne Degnan and two women. Problem was, it was a fabrication. Hirons had not confessed yet. The reporter had concocted the story from so-called unimpeachable sources. The other Chicago newspapers copied a lot of it out and did their own confession story. So that any jury that I would have gotten would have read it. You couldn't have been raised in Chicago without having read that. So according to William Hirons, it was then, with his own lawyers encouraging him, that he stopped fighting and decided to take the rap for three murders he did not commit. He claims he gathered the details he needed from newspaper accounts, along with information he was fed by authorities, and constructed a convincing enough confession. In doing so, the 17-year-old took the certain future of life behind bars over a trial and the possibility of a death sentence. In the 40s, the death penalty was used and used swiftly. The newspapers calling for his uh, conviction and execution and his own lawyers capitulated. I have no doubt that had they challenged the evidence in a meaningful, adversarial way, that Bill Hirons couldn't have been convicted of any of these three murders. The prosecutors who put Hirons away have since died. So have his former attorneys and most of the people involved in Hirons' interrogation and conviction. But half a century later, Hirons still has powerful opponents. They include Chicago's mayor and former state's attorney Richard M. Daley. Daley, who has strongly supported Hirons' continued incarceration, declined to be interviewed for this show. Prosecutor Thomas Epack argued against Hirons' parole requests in the 1980s and 90s. All roads lead to William Herons. To us, those that have followed this case, the evidence remains overwhelming. He should spend his life in the penitentiary. This shouldn't be coming up. It was a long time ago. He's supposed to remain in prison and everybody get on with their life. I just feel that he's a sick man. He's doing good things in prison. That's fine. But we just don't want anybody else to be harmed. As long as people remember William Herons is what he was and what he was convicted of, they have got, the Herons people, have got an uphill battle to get out of prison, in my opinion. He represents everything that people are afraid of. So despite what he does or who he has become, they will not release him. Herons does have an influential new ally, in January 2002, the Center on Wrongful Convictions at Chicago's Northwestern University School of Law took on the case. The renowned group relies on the work of law students and has helped to free nine people from death row in Illinois. They say that in their experience, this story ranks among the worst. The Hirons case is a recipe for a textbook wrongful conviction. It has police misconduct. It has prosecutorial misconduct. It has incompetent defense counsel. It has junk science. It has false confessions. And it has prejudicial pretrial publicity like 
un unlike any case we have ever seen. William Hirons is now in his 70s and suffering from diabetes. Despite being one of the most impressive cases of rehabilitation in the Illinois system, he has been denied his freedom at every opportunity. He served longer than any other prisoner in the history of Illinois. He's done more than any other prisoner in the history of the state of Illinois. I don't mean just in time, I mean in terms of good. And he's helped more than any other prisoner I can think of. It's time to let the old man out. Hiron's only options for freedom are clemency or parole. He is still battling to get his story told his way before his time runs out and live out his days as a free man. I'd just like to take a walk around the block or whatever. The freedom of just uh, being able to go someplace.